Okay, guys, he's back. The legend James Pierce from The Athletic is back with me to have a chat about the Reds. And that's what we all like doing, talking about Liverpool in these crazy, crazy times and world we live in. James, welcome back. Hi, Dave. You okay? Well, as good as can be, I suppose. Health is your wealth. That's the main thing, I suppose. But um, we just get into Liverpool straight away. It's been a weird few weeks, I have to say it. Um, it's been on, on charted territory, really, I suppose, for the last two or three years. We've had it so well, James. We've had it so well that any sort of dip and it's all hell breaks loose all over social media and, and all, as you know. Um, we could talk about what, why we think it's happened. Injuries, decisions, VAR, no centre-backs. Um, what do you think is the biggest reason for the dip? For the dip in form, do you think it's maybe no the centre back issue? What, what do you think? Do you know what I, I think? You touched on then there, there are a number of factors. Um, the, the biggest one for me has been the fact that so many key players have been out of form at the same time. Um, you know, you, when you think back over the last few years, you know, Firmino, Mane, Salah, they, they've each had little periods where the goals have dried up, but where Liverpool have always been able to cope is that someone else will step up. You know, if, if Mane's having a dip, Salah will go on yeah. a scoring run and or vice versa. And and to, it was a real rarity that, you know, since the turn of the year, really, um, all three of them seem to have, have lost their way. At a time also when I, I think you've also got to cut them some slack in terms of, it's not like they're missing loads and loads of chances. L Liverpool have actually struggled to create chances, especially against deep line defences. You know, we've seen that against the points they've dropped against teams that they should be beating, like West Brom, like Fulham, even before that against against Brighton, of course, Burnley last week. So, um, so yeah, I think partly as well the injuries. I think um, probably because Liverpool did so well initially without Van Dijk and then even after they lost Gomez, you know, they still... You know, it's easy to forget now that Liverpool started the new year top of the Premier League. Like it doesn't feel like it because it's been such a hard, long slog since. But you know, you're talking about only just over, you know, what was it, four, four and a half weeks ago? It was, it was the turn of the year. Liverpool were top of the Premier League, but yeah, it it does feel like the injuries have caught up with them in terms of, you know, of course, at a time when the goals have dried up for the front three, you're thinking, oh, you know, if only they had Jota to turn to. You know he was such a such a brilliant fourth option for Klopp, and he, you know, we know that, you know, that there is too big a drop off between the front three and the others. You know, the likes of Minamino, the likes of of Origi. Um, that was a thing that Jota, his arrival, had really addressed. So that's hurt Liverpool, and I think that the other big thing is the fact that you know Fabinho has been brilliant in general at centre half. Same when when Henderson's filled in, I think he's proved he can play that position. But it's more how much it hurts Liverpool further forward in terms of, you know, the midfield is so much weaker and the balance of the team isn't as good. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, a lot of people forget Fabinho is like he's like a natural centre half. He's been on he's actually saved us in a lot of games, really, hasn't he? But we miss him in midfield. <laughs> he's a midfielder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you see the United game the weekend. He tackles like a midfielder. Do you know what I mean? He doesn't tackle yeah. like a defender. So I don't blame him. No, no, a hundred percent. No, no, he's. No, I, I think you know if you were dishing out, kind of, you know, we're at the halfway point of the Premier League season. If you were dishing out kind of a Player of the Year award, you know, I think Fabino would be right in the mix for Liverpool in terms of how influential he's been, and you have to give him immense credit for the way in which he's stepped into a role which was pretty alien to him. I know he'd played there a couple of times before, <clears throat> but not much. And to perform at the level he has done has been remarkable. And imagine where Liverpool would be if he hadn't adjusted it to it so quickly. But you're right, yeah, you know, there was a lot of debate over the, the decision to, to give United the free kick that ultimately led to the winning goal last weekend at Old Trafford. You know, the contact was minimal, you know, but... I think I think Cavani was quite clever. I think it was. I think you you're right. It was the kind of challenge that a midfielder would make in a, in the centre circle. Um, yeah. You know, and you and you 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 go there to win the ball. I think 
a natural centre half wouldn't try and make that challenge on the edge of his own box. And we've seen it a couple of times from Fabino. There was the one I think against Sheffield United, wasn't there, when he was unfortunate to give away the penalty that night because yeah. I thought, you know, I, I thought it was just outside the box where he made the challenge. Um, but um, but yeah, yeah, no no blame attached to him whatsoever. In the same way that you know, I, I certainly wouldn't attach any blame whatsoever to Reese Williams for the FA Cup to defeat to Man United as well, because, um, you know, he's another player who's been thrown in at the deep end and has yeah. to suddenly yeah. Yeah. jump up, you know, so many levels in terms of what he was used to previously. Um, and, you know, for the most part, Reese Williams has, has done outstandingly well. Yeah, I, I actually think I felt sorry for him. He got a lot of stick on the usual garbage on social media. But I mean, you have to put the blame on Liverpool. I don't I don't usually criticise them very much. But I mean, we've known since the October game against Everton when Van Dijk was out pretty much for the season. Then a week or two later, two or three weeks, I think it was a week or two later, Gomez got injured for England, which looked like a, a season ending. You know, we've known about this. So they should have been working on something you would have thought up until January. Now, they still could be. I mean, it doesn't close till Sunday, but it's looking unlikely. But for Club of Liverpool stature, <clears throat> to be playing two centre midfielders in big games, missing them from the middle. Henderson especially, we miss him big time in the middle. Yeah. And Fabinho at centre half for a big club of Liverpool stature to have a young lad like Williams and Matt Phillips who, to be honest, probably is on tried and Matt who's been injured and will be injured probably before the end of the season again because he could probably only play one game a week, to be fair. And we're going to have at least two games a week right up to the end of the season because it's compressed. I, I, I think Liverpool, well, they could prove me wrong, but I've missed I've missed the real thing here. I, what do you think on the centre-back issue? Yeah, well, I, I think, first of all, it's not just benefit of hindsight here. I think, you know, I think a lot, a lot of us probably flagged it last summer that um, I, I could see the kind of the rationale behind not signing a centre-back. But by the same token, I thought it was a massive gamble because... Yes, I know it was a summer when money was tight. You know, Liverpool had to make decisions in terms of, OK, well, we need left-back cover for Robertson. Um, you know, of course, no one had a crystal ball and knew that Simicus was going to be injured for most of the first half of the season. Um, we all, I think, accepted that they had to go and get elite cover for the front three, which they did with Jota, which you'd say was an amazing deal for Liverpool. You know, and then it was cruel the way that they lost him in that dead rubber against Midland. And then Thiago, I think everyone was buzzing about that signing. So they could only have done so much. And I think at the time they felt that, <clears throat> well, for a start, Van Dijk is, a, is like made of granite. He never misses a game. You know, he'd been, in, I think he'd played every single game for two successive Premier League seasons. So I, I could understand at that point why they went, well, do you know what? In a, in a summer when we've got to make tough financial decisions, you know, we've obviously we've got Gomez, we've got Matip. Okay, Matip's fitness is a bit ropey, is record-wise, um, but hopefully, you know, we've got to the bottom of that. Then you've obviously got Fabino as the fourth choice when needs be. At the time, you know, Billy Cometio, who'd lit the place up in pre-season, he was regarded as like the fifth choice, and then you had Reese Williams sixth choice and probably Nat Phillips seventh. So, um, you know, nobody could have foreseen what had happened. But you're right, I think. I think once once you lose Van Dijk and Gomez in quick succession, I expected Liverpool to put plans in place to to have a central defender waiting on January the first. And I think you know I've written extensively on the Athletic about why that hasn't happened because you know it's not that people at the club are are blind to the issues. Of course they're not. Um, you know they know as well as anyone what Liverpool need. But you know two there's two major issues. One is availability. And the other one is money, and um, you know, the, you know whether and and people say, well, you know, they got they should be able to find the money from somewhere. Well, the, the reality is that the way FSG operate, Liverpool has to live within its means, and you know the revenues have taken a, a huge, huge hit. And I know people will say, well, you know, surely there's so much money available for qualifying for the Champions League, you could you could even you know risk <clears throat> thirty or forty million pound now, knowing it could. It could be the difference between banking 70 or 80 million next season, which I completely understand. Um, but it's just not the way that things have been done under FSG so far. So, um, and, and I do think, like we talked about earlier on, I do think that 
because results stayed so good relatively, you know, in a season where no one was going to ever get 97, 98, 99 points this season. You know, we said before, Liverpool started 2021 top of the table. So it's not like, it's not like they've been on a downward spiral since they lost Gomez and Van Dijk and, and they just haven't addressed the issue. I think, I think they almost felt, well, look, we can't get who we want for the long term now. Um, so what we'll do is we'll get through to the end of the season. And, um, and I think where, where, where in my head things have shifted is that there's been such a downturn over the last month that I've gone from thinking, well, OK, that, that's admirable in a way to stick to your long term plan. But then now I'm thinking, well, hang on a minute. You know, I know Liverpool don't really do short term fixes, but sometimes you've just got to be pragmatic and go, well, actually, you know, surely there must be someone that we could get on a loan that we could yeah. get on a short term deal. Um and I know that's easier said than done. And I know, you know, I, I think it is more complex than that because we all know Liverpool play with such a high line, you know, that you can't just go and pluck the fifth choice from some mid-table team and go, right, he'll suddenly make Liverpool better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So it's not, it's not straightforward yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I am amazed that we've reached this point in the window and, and still nothing's happened. Um, I was just reading something today, uh, Subotic, you remember that guy, I think he's a Serbian international, he's on a free, he's actually, I played for Klopp, I think for Dortmund at the time, um, but as you said, they're not just going to pluck something out of the air, it's, it's not the FSG way, is it? I mean, it's not the Michael Edwards way, that'd be like panic setting in to do something now, I think, do you not think? Yeah, yeah, and, and I think, and I think you also have to be realistic in terms of, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if you're going to sign someone who hasn't played, recently which chances are that is now the kind of like where you're having to look yeah then how long are they going to need to get up to speed because you can't you can't just sign someone on a free who's a free agent or someone who's been been on like completely on the fringes somewhere yeah. Yeah. and go bang like you're now going to help us win the premier league that's just that's just absolutely nonsensical you know it has to be someone of a particular standard and with a particular skill set that can come in and, and actually help out. And I think, um, you know, and I, and I think that's probably where, you know, I, I do have a lot of sympathy with the frustration of, of supporters in terms of, you think, I, I don't think, you know, no one's really expecting Liverpool to go and spend 40 or 50 million pound on, you know, on, on an elite centre half now, because I think everyone accepts or anyone with half a brain accepts that that money just isn't there at the moment with, with the way that COVID is and, and the financial situation at the club. But it's like, yeah. you'd like to think with just how good Liverpool's recruitment network is, how good their scouting network is, that there would be someone somewhere who could come in and, and just help them out, really. Between... Yeah, like maybe till summer even, like a, lot, a, a six-month loan or something. And yeah. Was, going off, was it Melito or Melito? Or was it Tour de Fort in Madrid, was it? Young lad, Melito, yeah. I think his name was. Yeah, yeah. So you know, the, there are options out there, but uh, again, you know, I, I, I mean, Liverpool aren't blind to this. Like they, I, I think, you know, and and I actually think if there was a suitable short-term fix out there, they would they would do it. And I think you know they would do it, you know, in before the window shuts. But the issue is, can they find a short-term fix that isn't just blind panic? It's not just yeah. plucking. Stephen Corker from QPR, like they did five years ago, and and like because oh, they just needed... well, remember Kiriakos, remember Kiriakos, yeah. Oh, I mean, he was another one where you know yeah. Benitez Benitez was told, you know, you've only got I think it was one point five million, and said right that that's all you can spend on a centre half, and then so suddenly, you know, you rather than shopping, you know, at the yeah. at the absolute top, yeah. you're yeah. you're shopping in the you know the bargain basement. So um, so yeah, that that's the challenge. For Liverpool, and I'm, you know, I'm sure they're still, they're still looking at the moment. Um, but yeah, if if it doesn't happen, then you know they're just so reliant, aren't they, on keeping Joel Matip fit because, yeah. um, and keeping Fabinho fit, of course, because I think you know I don't think it's too big a statement to say that if Joel Matip had started against Man United, then Liverpool would still be in the FA Cup. I think they'd have won that tie. Because they yeah. wouldn't have given away those soft goals. Yeah. Um, I said the same it's... thing today to a friend of mine. I said, "You start Matt if we don't lose that game." Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. you know we hope you know 
so much seems to now, if, if Liverpool don't sign a centre-half, then so much rests on also not just being able to keep him fit, but trying to make sure that he can play you know, more yeah. regularly than he has yeah. been doing. Because you know, clearly they, they feel at the moment they've got to ease him back in gently. But you know, I was looking at the fixtures and there's a, there's a two-week spell in February when we play Man City, we play Leicester, we play Leipzig, we play Everton. Oh. Um, you know, yeah. and that's 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 a big, big couple of weeks. And you know, really, you need Joel Matip to play all four of them. When you know, at the moment, you'd probably say, you know, probably two would be more likely. Yeah. But yeah, um, yeah. So I think, you know, that that is going to be absolutely key. Trying to trying to get him out there as much as possible. I, I think we'd be in even more trouble if Fabinho ever got bloody injured long term. My God, what would we do then? But, yeah, um, yeah. You know, so but the other thing is, James. I mean, you look at the fixtures. I mean, tomorrow night Spurs away, and then West Ham away on Sunday. I mean, they're two tough games. West Ham are flying at the moment. Spurs are good, playing good football, scoring goals. Son and Kane have a nice partnership going. I know we have a great record against Spurs over the last few seasons, ever since that October 2017 hammering that we took at Wembley. Remember the four-one Lovren and a bit of a nightmare that day. Yeah. We had to look back against Spurs, but I think tomorrow night. I know, I think Matip and Hendo are okay for tomorrow night. Whether he start now, I don't know. But is Matip okay? I know Henderson is in the squad. Yeah, yeah, I think I'd expect Henderson and Matip both to come back into the team and start. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that that again will undoubtedly raise the bar performance-wise, you know, being able to have Matip and Fabinho as the, as the centre-halves, Henderson's energy and, and dynamism back in midfield. So that will help. And I think... Um, yeah, I think you're, you're right. You know, quite often we always say, don't we? Oh, it's a massive week. It's you know, this yeah. game's huge, that game's huge. But like, I don't think you can really state that enough in terms of this week because um, you know, top, Tottenham and then West Ham, two two teams who, who are very close to Liverpool in the table, two teams who are who are in decent form at the moment, and um, you know, Liverpool have already slipped from I think what first to fifth over the course of this month, and you know, suddenly. Suddenly, you know, you, you, you they could could drop even further, and then you find yourself in a in an absolute desperate scrap for for the top four. Yet, you know, if Liverpool were to go and beat Tottenham and then go and beat West Ham, you know, in a few days' time, we'd all be talking about how the title challenge is back on track and, and Liverpool are back right. within uh, back right. within touching distance of the top. So, um, yeah, that's that's why at the moment it, it just feels like the stakes are so high this week because as as disappointing as January has been and as kind of as difficult as it's been to take to see Liverpool drop in so many cheap points against teams they should be beating. At the moment, the damage done to the season is still definitely repairable. You know, there's not like, you know, aside from going out, aside from going out the FA Cup, which I think most people would accept was a distant third in the priority list anyway. You know, Liverpool, they, they can, you know, they would, well, there's seven points, I think, behind at the moment as we talk now, and um, you know, at the halfway point of the season. So that is that is repairable. Um, yet it won't be repairable if they go and suffer another couple of setbacks this week. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think to be honest with you, James. I mean, tomorrow night's could go either way. It really could. I mean, we could lose tomorrow and lose against West Ham, you know. And then I'd say we're out of the bloody title race. If we lose the next two, to be honest with you. I mean, City look on fire at the moment. They're scoring. I won't mention Manchester United, but you know, what I mean, City for me. Would be probably the favourites at this stage to win it ahead of United now, but I, but but there's other teams. There's even Everton. How can we mention Everton? I mean, they'll they'll go. They have games in hand of us. Leicester City, Spurs, even West Ham have a good side. So it's a weird season, and I just think tomorrow is pivotal. I mean, and draws are no good anymore. We seven draws already. We've had too many draws. What was it nine wins, seven draws, three losses? It's it, the draws kill you. As good as losing a game is drawing a bloody game. So we, we need to, I think tomorrow's huge. I, I can't overstate tomorrow. I think we need a win tomorrow. I really do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is it is big. And um, you know, hopefully you know, the one amidst the disappointment of losing at Old Trafford, I, I think I, I did come away from the game on, on Sunday actually pretty positive, you know, not not in a defensive sense, but I think the big thing was seeing greater fluency going forward yeah. and seeing Liverpool create proper chances and you know, Firmino, you know, him him clicking again, you know, a couple of assists for him, Salah helping himself to a couple of goals. And so I think I think that should fuel belief 
going into Thursday night. I know I know the stat will keep on getting trotted out. They haven't Liverpool haven't scored in four successive home league game. Uh, sorry, four successive league, league games for the first time since two thousand. But you know that there there were signs of attacking wise things starting to click again at Old Trafford. Um, and as we said before, with Matip back, with Henderson back, you know that strengthens two other key departments. Yeah. So th- there's no reason why Liverpool can't go to Tottenham and win. I think the fascinating thing for me will be how Mourinho sets Tottenham up because, you know, at, at Anfield back in December when we were talking about it as a top of the table clash, you know, it was typical Mourinho, wasn't it, really, in terms of parking the bus and trying to nick something on the counter-attack. And, you know, he very, very nearly got himself a point before Firmino had that bullet header in the the last uh, closing seconds. So, you know, you just wonder with the form that Tottenham have been in since and then the fact that... The fragility of Liverpool, maybe? Yeah, yeah, whether whether it will... Whether that will encourage Mourinho to come out and play a bit more. And then, yeah, and and I think, you know, I think what we do know is that when games open up and there is more space to operate in, that we do tend to see the best of Liverpool, certainly this season. Um, You know, you look at the big games when... You know, they went to the Etihad and played really well when Klopp was really bold with his team selection. You know, you think about, you know, the the win the win at Chelsea, you know, the win over Arsenal at home. You know, even the first half performance, I thought, against Man United in the league game was yeah. was very, very good when Liverpool should have should have taken control. So, um, yeah, that gives me hope. The fact that it's actually tended to have been against the lesser teams with the low block who show very little ambition that where Liverpool have have struggled really to break them down and um yeah but you know a win against Tottenham would just be worth so much more than three points really in terms of the grand scheme of things because I, I think it just it just lifts all that negativity that that has descended over the last month yeah, yeah. it's confidence as well I mean a win gives you so much confidence I presume Liverpool will probably stay in London will they, they I yeah I don't, I don't, I don't yeah, yeah. I mean, Klopp did his did his press conference earlier today, which usually suggests that that's ahead of travelling down. I know, I know. With some of the away games this season, they've travelled on the day to, to to the games, but they tended to have been games that are much closer than than um, than this one. You know, I think usually with London, they would they would travel the, the day before. So um, yeah, obviously, COVID has kind of changed oh, everything yeah. in terms yeah. of. Yeah, you know what they can do and where they can go and where they can stay and but um but yeah yeah I think the fact he did his press conference duties earlier today would indicate that they were they were travelling this evening. Just before you go, uh, one player who we really miss and we, we touched on him earlier, but Jota. I mean, he he, he would give me so much more confidence in this Liverpool team, even if he was on the bench as an option. Any word on Jota coming back? Is it two three weeks? Or what's the story with Jota? Yeah, I think it'll be another couple of weeks before we see him back. Um, you know, I think I think Klopp Klopp said when he when when the Liverpool lost him, I think they, they, they he said it would be six to eight weeks. And I think initially Liverpool thought you know it could well be you know hopefully by the back end of January. I think I think realistically now it's probably going to be you know uh, you know t- you know potentially I think I think hopefully early early ish February starting yeah. to do some training again and then. It's just a case of how quickly they can get him up to speed before they're ready to to unleash him again. And um, you know, I think I think they are being very careful this season. I think we've seen that with you know Cater has come back a few times, hasn't he, and, and broken down. And so they've they've kind of like decided now with Cater that they're going to do a lot of work with him to try and kind of build up that core kind of yeah. fitness levels yeah. to try and make sure it doesn't happen again. And and I'm sure with Jota, you know, it will be a case of well. You know, of course, they're desperate to get him back as soon as possible, but they won't want to rush it and no. and risk losing him again. But certainly, you know, by the you know, as long as there's no setbacks, and and certainly by the middle of February, you'd like to think he'd be I'm he'd be bitch. back up to speed. And yeah, and then you know, of course, that maybe just for a makes... game, maybe mid February. Yeah, like yeah, you'd like to you'd like to think so. And you know, having him back would make such a big difference because. Um, you know, I think I think we've seen recently that you know the fact that Minamino keeps getting overlooked. That yeah. clearly Klopp doesn't feel as if he's seeing enough from him on a daily basis. Um, you know, Origi, you know, hasn't hasn't been able to deliver when he's been given opportunities. So um, yeah, Liverpool really do need Jota back as soon as possible. Uh, like we, I was just saying, we drew seven, but 
We've drawn about four since Jota was gone. And I think one or two of them, maybe even three of them, could have been turned into wins with Jota there. And that's a huge difference. That's a five, six point, seven point difference. You know what I mean? Yeah, oh, a hundred percent. Because, you know, he Liverpool have been robbed, haven't they, of that kind of that fourth elite attacking option. So yeah. I know I know Klopp you know, before when Jota was fit, he was able to to rotate it, wasn't he? He was able to leave one of the one of the one of the main attackers out, or you know, there were times when he played all four, but it it just gave you, you know, that that extra option that he just hasn't had since. And and I think we've seen that in some of the games when Klopp's been slow to make changes when things haven't been going great. It's it's almost like you can see that it's like, well, I know it's not quite happening tonight in terms of the players that are out there, but I'm not convinced the players I've got sat behind me on the bench are able to actually come on and yeah. really influence this game. Um, yet, of course, if he, you know if he had Jota there, then you'd, you know, you wouldn't even think twice, would you, about unleashing him for the last 20, 25 minutes? So, um, yeah, you know, he was he was an absolute revelation, wasn't he, Jota, in terms of how quickly he just adjusted to life at Liverpool. I think, you know, was it nine goals and 17 appearances? And, Every um, time he was on the pitch, I thought he'd score, to be honest. Yeah, he just made things happen, didn't he? And he, he just looked the perfect fit as well with his, his energy and his, his, you know, his powerful and direct and clinical and um so yeah you know he you know he he's um it's going to be going to be great to to finally see him back in a liverpool shirt again absolutely well james we we'll leave it there you're a busy man i'll let you go thank you very much for coming on i really appreciate it good luck with everything going forward and let's hope the reds form gets better stay safe talk to you soon bro cheers dave cheers mate